I'd like to thank our sponsors, Blood Moon Box, a monthly subscription box service for period pads and tampons to help support all humans who have a cycle for that time of the month and no need to run to a store to mix and match period supplies that don't cater to the entire ebbs and flows of your cycle. There are two box options based on your cycle, light and medium, and then heavy. And in addition to the period products, you'll also receive PMS herbal teas, a candle, and some other items for your time of the month. You can reserve a box by navigating to bloodmoonbox.com. And bloodmoonbox.com is on a mission to destigmatize the idea of period blood. At Blood Moon Box, they believe that it is the time to honor the enchanting magic within every person who has a cycle. So join us in embracing the magic of your cycle with Blood Moon Box. Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one on one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well being, spirituality, and consciousness. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Dr. Maitha Al-Hassan, PhD, who is a co-executive producer for the Golden Globe and Peabody-winning Hulu series, Rami. She also serves as an executive producer for the upcoming docuseries, American Muslims, A History Revealed. She is a Harvard Religion and Public Life Fellow in Media and Entertainment, a USC Civic Media Fellow, and an Open Society Fellow focused on cultivating a TV show model that incubates more just stories. Uh, Hassan also sees her work as that of, of a freedom doula and an engaged witness reviving the traditions of the feral femme, which we'll get into in the show. She's a historian, TV writer, producer, journalist, arts-based social justice organizer, and mending practitioner. She's so many things and more, and I'm so grateful to call her a friend right now. So welcome to the show, Maitha. Yes, me, and thank you for having me. <laughs> So to kick it off, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about what it is to sort of create our own reality, especially given, you know, the cultural context that we're in. What is your perspective right now on being able to create our own reality? Okay, this is going to be my quadruple Aquarius answer to you. (laughs) For folks who have not been inducted into the world of the Zodiac It is a pretty floaty, fluid way of being in the world that is constantly emergent. So what I might share now with your, (laughs) with uh, a response to your question might not be the same tomorrow or in two hours. So (laughs) we're just going to go with it. I, I, as you were speaking, I was, uh, I was painting a visual and the visual I was imagining was a uh, a a world an interior world that was spinning a cauldron of sorts uh that had a a searing light pierce through it to make this formula within us that we're stirring as well uh, so i always imagine this idea and i know it's a It's a deep question that has hit the world of science around where, what is consciousness and where is consciousness located? How do we even begin to talk about what consciousness looks like, um, interrelated to each other, intraconnected, as Dan Siegel talks about in his latest work? I myself, um, I'm actually not as interested with how we create reality as much as I am with what, how fluent we are in reading signs. Mm. And so that is, maybe that's my love language, so to speak as well, is thinking about the ordering of the divine in communication with us as we're crafting this choose your own adventure world. What does it look like? Uh, You know, I guess I could back up. Um, I, I, for a long time thought that when, and when I speak about signs, I speak about symbols, uh, metaphors, uh, synchronicities 
that come into being and are way beyond the world of coincidence. And I thought that those things led me into a certain direction of, okay, I have to take this job. Okay, this is a relationship I need to fight for because look at how it started. It is, I couldn't even have written this or imagined it. But now I'm starting to think that this is just my reality, that my life is filled with signs. And it's really just about how, as I said, fluent and my mastery around that fluency of the signs that I'm at. And really, that stage of quote unquote development is re reflected in the signs that I think are being communicated to me. So that interplay is what I'm interested in, is what is unfolding semiotically and how much we can see. Mm. And I think that is what, what we understand is creating our reality. Mm. Oh my gosh, Matha. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I hope that work. I'm I get just this floaty Aquarius. <laughs> no, it's so good. I'm always like so excited to connect with you and talk to you because I love the way that you know you're so eloquent um, when you kind of speak about your perspective. And I think, you know, when you talk about the fluency of signs and symbols, I think you're also kind of pointing us in the direction of what is sacred. And I think, you know, it feels like there's a lot of kind of models of reality in which people do not actually look for the sacred, uh, believe in the sacred, and so they don't actually have an interplay, a kind of a two-way dialogue with this, this sort of sacredness of life, the symbolic nature, the synchronicities, the magic, I would say, of life. And so, you know, that to me has been very interesting. And I'm curious, you know, when you talk to people, especially in the very scientific minded community, uh, ones in which, you know, they don't really have room for the sacred, uh, what would you tell them? It's interesting because I have found scientists, we can go for that, or um, people who are hard science-based to be in two camps, if I had to be crude about it. One is materialists, again, going back to the field of consciousness, who in that world, believe that everything is created from us and there is no space for that magic. There is no space for a divine X unknown. And then when you talk to the scientists who either have been guided to the world of science through mystical interventions or through their own research, it, it almost was irrefutable to go down this lane of exploring ancient wisdom traditions, contemplative practices. They have become some of the most fascinating people that I've consulted with around the sacred because they're tapping into a tradition. And this is what I would say to the, sci the scientists in that other materialist camp they're tapping into a tradition that existed for most of how we understood scientific exploration. And that is a relationship between the material and the metaphysical or the mystical and in connection with the spiritual synchronizing science. So we just have to look at where we both are from. Um, the Abbasid dynasty, um, the world of Baghdad that was a forerunner to putting science and spirituality in conversation. Not the only one, but this is a great example. You know, they called it the golden age of Islam, um, where astronomy was revolutionized, but astronomy was contingent on it's conversation with astrology. And we can't explore or silo off one without understanding its relationship to the other. So for a, a long period of, well, I don't want to say a long period. Let's just X that powder out. For most of our ancient wisdom and contemplative practice traditions, they did have a scientific way of understanding spirituality as well. And I think when we 
t- when science sometimes talks about, well, or the progressive scientists, I guess you would call it, when they say, look, science is validating what these ancient cultures have already known, they neglect that these <laughs> ancient cultures actually also had scientific methodology and practice as well. So the sacred was never disavowed. The sacred was central. Wow. So, okay. So <laughs> I'm like, wow, we can go in so many different directions here. Um, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about the feral femme, which is kind of this theme that you that has emerged over the last several years. Can you tell us like, what exactly is the feral femme and why is it so important? For me, the feral femme which emerged from a very interesting experience that led me to dive deep into the world of mental illness diagnosis of women. It, it's ungovernable wildness that is overflowing from divine and sacred femme energy. And another way I think about describing this and we can go in more detail, is that when I say femme, I'm talking about the leveler of hierarchies, about an, obliver- about an obliteration of structures of equality and inequality, which might sound uh, a little facetious, but again, I can get into that. It's a champion of just sacred ordering, a flower of rivers of knowledge from other realms, the anointer of multiverse wisdom, and a vessel for cyclical regeneration. So I think of the femme as this intervention around what the last couple of decades has called the wild woman, and to think about or offer an invitation for all gendered peoples and non-gendered peoples to locate this energy that I've just described, this radical wildness that's in all of us. And I've been thinking about as well what um, what I'm calling patriarchal masculinity has had to do to repress the femme within them. So again, this, this femme energy, which is fierce, which is wild, which is why I call it feral, I want to also invoke a notion of nature in the way that the... Um, unrestrained flow of energy is surging through us is um, is part of a sacred harmony that we've um, forcibly repressed for a variety of reasons. And for me, a lot is tied to the anti-life approach we've taken with earth through industrialization and apologies for getting academic and technical. (laughs) Um, And it logically makes sense that when there is an anti-life relationship to earth, that there's also an attack on the femme as this spirit of, as I said, cyclical regeneration. So I'm really curious about exploring what it would mean to cradle that energy, to nourish it for all gendered and non-gendered peoples. What is the kind of um, fallout for society, uh, you know, as we have repressed this feral feminine side, you know, like what is, what has it done to society? Like how, how has it impacted our relationships? How has it impacted the way we work and culture? I mean, what have you sort of noticed? That's a big question. I, as, as I mentioned this, it, this urge to control, which goes back to this, this impulse to contain towards domination. It's first, it's one of its first victims is the femme because it can't be contained. So starting with the theoretical, what does this look like here and now? Well, there's 
no surprise that we are and have been for the last hundreds of years raping, extracting, pillaging the earth, the very giver of life. And again, fem is not necessarily connected to people with wombs, but it is this, it's this inclination towards reproduction. And that, of course, has meant climate crisis. Now, that's just big level. Now, let's look at some trends we are noticing that are happening in the U.S. specifically, and then we can think about the larger world. Um, Fertility rates have been on the decline. Birthing, pregnancy, uh, all these practices of reproduction they have been mechanized and they have also be, been stripped of the sacredness, as we mentioned. So people who are pregnant are expected to work and labor. You're given only a couple of months to, to bond with a child if you're even given that. And the whole process of birthing is also incredibly disconnected from the quote unquote natural experience. And not to say that the Western approach to medicine hasn't saved lives, but as we've seen again with the um, the incredible risk attached to birthing in the U.S., our birth outcomes are some of the worst in the world, and especially even more um, deplorable once you start adding race. Um, for Black women, it's it's really risky to give birth in the U.S. So um, that's just fertility. And as we were talking about, uh, or as I mentioned, um, we're talking about a, a decline in sperm fertility as well. And again, a lot of this stems from a theory around turning our bodies into machines. It goes back to industrialization and how the end of that is a sort of wildness that cannot find its its way towards recreating itself. Um, Now, let's go back to relationships between people who I would call high femme, so a little bit more femme, feminine energy, or high mask folks, people who have more masculine energy, because again, we're carrying all these energies within us. And the the balance is a harmony between the, the two. Um, what we've found, and I know you and I have had conversations about this, is the way that, um, especially in a workplace, <laughs> that <laughs> still looks a lot like how modern-day professional professionalizing of labor looks, which is workplaces that are geared and designed for um, masculine bodies, you know, you, you have, you have that, that, um, article that has come out about how much colder offices are for women than men and how miserable that is. You have discussions, like let's take the scope outside of the U S you have discussions in other countries about giving people who bleed at least a day off or month, because that's not something people conceived about (laughs) once the workplace was shifting. You have a country like India that put that into policy before the U.S. could even begin to have this conversation. And I think Spain just also uh, put in policy for that for people with moon cycles. Um, So at the very heart of the design around this, and again, I would argue that all of it is anti-life and is also harmful for men. I mean, being in these enclosed offices without access to being outdoors and sitting down all day that's not good for anybody and at the at the very at the most heightened um tension around it is the body it was least thought about including if that makes sense can can you elaborate that last part metha yeah so um i um when these structures and systems are put into place, usually the people that put them into place, uh, and again, um, or not again. (laughs) (laughs) And when I talk about 
an archetype. I am not sh- trying to shame a certain group of people, but I'm just trying to explain the way things have been built. And I actually think they're harmful for everybody. So a workplace that was designed around rich male Western Europeans hasn't been revolutionized. And we're just trying to fit everybody that's different into that space. And it's turned out to be terrible for most folks, but most especially for people who are at the margins of that identity or set of identities. Um, And again, like we've said, women, (laughs) you know, um, uh, uh, women of color, um, these, these places have us last in mind because they weren't, we weren't first conceived of. And I think, you know, some people are in the camp of reforming. That's why there's, there are these DEI initiatives. I'm in the camp of obliterating and (laughs) rebuilding because I think, I mean, even if you look at, and I'm, I'm taking this conversation in so many places, but I have a brother who's on the spectrum of autism. And for a very long time, I've thought about how much at the margins around urban design, educational design, labor design, he and people who are like him are, you know, there's no sort of way for him to sustain himself independently, not really, given how ableist our workplaces. And so, again, that's not good for him, but that's terrible for us to be so limited in our imagination that we can't think of a diverse way of showing up in places of, I call it generative work. Um, I have I have some tension around production and labor, uh, which is very funny too, because we call work labor and we call <laughs> delivery labor. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I don't know if that's supposed to tell us that one is mechanized or the other one is supposed to be just as important as, as the other. <laughs> uh, you know, Maitha, I, as you were talking, I was sort of thinking, well, you know, now that AI and generative AI has come online, um, what does that mean? Right. Cause I think a lot of AI is kind of being, uh, is replacing a lot of work, and AI is really just a reflection of the power structures that exist yeah. in society today. So, what does that mean for our workplace? Especially if, like you said, like doesn't seem like we're really trying to revolutionize work, which has been set up largely for this sort of male uh, dominant twenty four seven, you know, kind of testosterone cycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. You just had me have a flood of thoughts. Well, first of all, AI is going to lead us to the same discourses and debates we continue to have around social media, around apps, around net- social networking sites. The The fact that just a small group of people from Silicon Valley based their assumptions around human interaction, around their life experiences. Um, You know, another great example of this is dating apps. Dating apps show us pictures and age. Why are those the most, I mean, that's the, 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 the earliest beta version of dating apps, right? And they've shifted a little bit, but who, who would think a picture and age and maybe a job would be important things to know about in terms of coming together with a partner or soulmate? Maybe, you know, (laughs) a male from an Ivy League school would think that. And again, you know, Facebook was a a rating site, right, for women at Harvard, designed by Mark Zuckerberg, right? Isn't that the origin (laughs) story of it? And not much has expanded from that world. So we're constantly trying to stretch out, and this is why I'm fascinated with social media entity with audience and user participation in these spaces, because even given this limited movement for activity, people still can find ways to be subversive. Now, going to AI, who's creating the AI? And that should be the central question, because again, who created the workplace structure 
centuries ago who created social media apps, those group of people are defining our reality of interaction with each other. Now, AI itself is, there's, there's a really fascinating twist on it. I had one of my students write about how or research why a lot of AI technology had female voices. Did we talk about this ever? No, I don't think so. Yeah. So um, she had theorized and looked for scholarly support and found many film and TV examples, including The Good Place. Um, She... I don't know if you remember that film with... Yes, um, I do. Was it Joaquin fin- yes, Phoenix who yes. falls in love with his yeah yes. AI technology? All women. And so the setup usually is that there is this subversant assistant, aid, and this is how AI can provide a benefit to our lives and make it convenient by offering a service of something or a familiar voice that's feminine, that's subservient and subordinate. Um, and, and, you know, those two examples too, they're subordinate to a male figure. Now, what they offer as this pivot or the scary future around AI is that these women will develop consciousness that will undermine the power of the male, <laughs> which I don't, I, I, I definitely think we need to be concerned about AI because as we said, the origin story of who is primarily making it, how it's being birthed, the way it's think it's being thought of in a very capitalist, short-sighted, profit-driven manner, because that kind of framework has a lot of trouble seeing the longevity or future casting for what this could mean and what could transform to. Um, I also, and now I'll add the third layer of meta analysis. <laughs> I wonder, and I said and thought about this, I wonder if AI is the next version of ego. Ooh. And what I mean by this is, could ego be a form of AI? Wait, say more about that because <laughs> now I'm like, I'm like very, I, 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 I want to double click on that because, um, w- say more about that. Like, what do you mean by the, by ego? Yeah. Yeah. What is, what is the origin of ego? Where did it come from? What was it designed for? Does it lead when it too much of it is invested or it's not sublimated towards spirit? does it lead to dangerous outcomes if it's not within a container of a a soul that has spiritual practice around it? It is a scary proposition. And we've seen what overinvestment in ego looks like. And is AI the birth child of that ego? And is ego the original AI? Does that make sense? It, ma- it makes sense to me, yeah. I, you know, and it, the reason why this makes sense is because I had a guest on the show uh, who wrote the book Romancing the Shadow. Her name is uh, Dr. Connie Zweig. And uh, she kind of blew my mind about this concept that there's, you know, the personality, which is there's largely like the ego associated with that and the shadow associated with that. And then there's like the soul and the spirit and, you know, maybe this connection to higher consciousness. And those two things are are separate, but also kind of connect together into the hum- into the human, right? I think a lot of people have differing views on whether the there is kind of this duality between us, you know, or this distinction between the soul and the spirit and then the ego and the personality. And I, I sometimes like, you know, some of the examples that she had used uh, were like people like John of God or, you know, Osho or, you know, having, you know, priests molest young boys where on the spiritual realm, it seemed like they were moving towards spiritual enlightenment, but they had not done the work of integrating their shadow and dealing essentially with their ego. Um, so that's, and that's why I talk about sublimating it towards that higher consciousness because you know from my own spiritual tradition the idea of ego obliteration is not the goal it is as you were mentioning a kind of integration that is in service 
to the sacred. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Fascinating. I think we're just kind of at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to generative AI. And so I'm sure there's going to be a lot of shifts and changes in the coming years. Uh, So, Maith, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the male role in society and how it integrates with the feminine. I think we speak a lot about this uh, in our one-on-one conversations uh, about dating, about uh, what feels like appropriate, uh, and then also why why you think that men, you know, should essentially help lower a woman's cortisol levels? <laughs> um, well, I was wondering if it might be helpful to start with why I, or the, the um, genealogy of feral femme, because I think that speaks to your question. Yeah. I was dating somebody who... I thought on paper was incredibly compatible with me. He was excelling in the professional fields that we shared, which felt very rare. Social justice organizing, media, academia. And I tried to make this work. I remember though, and he would invite me to a lot of galas that he was a part of or ones that he would speak at. So he's a couple steps ahead of me in the work that I was doing. And I was at one of the galas and I just felt like this is one of the most anti-life <laughs> experiences to be in this windowless conference hall with a stage, terrible textiles for tablecloths, <laughs> 300 of the same meal that had no special love from the chef and um, servers that were being reprimanded if they didn't move quick enough. And, you know, this was also a social justice gala. (laughs) It was, all of it was bizarre to me. And then I also started to, and that relationship broke apart. But I think at that one gala, I started to realize that I can't be a gala date person. That's not, that's not who I am. And um, it, it opened the door to, realizing that I am this this sort of feral femme, but it is very confusing to people because the perception in the U.S. I'll speak for and actually has very much influenced how people look at, at feminism because of a very Western U.S. discourse around feminism. They become surprised when they hear about how I land around dating and what I think about in terms of cishet um, relations within an intimate setting or container. Um, So how how should I start this? (laughs) Talking about (laughs) finances, talking about um, uh, what I conceive of as feminist in what I call a patriarchal masculine world. And instead of using terms like toxic masculine, sometimes unhealed masculine, what that looks like. Yeah. I think start wherever you think. I mean, finances are good. And I think also just like layering in the context of our cultural kind of background, because I think that maybe that does yes. play a role. Yeah. So, okay. That's good. We we haven't even explained this, but um, I would say if I had to tell people where my parents are from, I would say all over the Middle East. It's a long, complicated story, but a lot from what is called the Levant, Syria, Lebanon, with ancestry in Egypt, what is now Saudi Arabia, Bedouin tribes from my dad's side, learning about that, that play of the indigenous. And then another layer of Islamic practice. And as you mentioned, I'm a co-executive producer on a show called Rami, where we've even explored how differently Islam sees the relationship between men and women and the financial obligation or the financial freedom that women have and the safety and security net that they have in those relationships that were big time feminist interventions way before Europe and even America had them. So for example, from the earliest days, divorce was a lot easier for women than, I mean, I'm watching Mad Men in the 1960s. I didn't realize that <laughs> they ne- women needed permission for divorce and couldn't do it under certain grounds. Um, and then here we talk about, you know, 
7th century Arabia, women divorcing men or, you know, our, our prophet marrying, being a 25-year-old, marrying a 40-year-old woman who was his boss, you know? <laughs> um, again, just a different world of being. But yeah, let's, let's set that context and tone. So in um, Islamic practice, and we covered this in the third season of Rami without being too didactic, um, uh, Muslim women, if they make money, and again, this is, you can think about the example of the prophet and his wife Khadija, that money is theirs to keep. And they decide if they want to contribute to family expenses, if they want to contribute to their partner. But the social moray is that it's their security and that they actually shouldn't be part of creating the financial protection or the foundation of the family. That's the role of the male in the household. And that, again, you know, I go back to feral femme is not about equality or inequality. And that's what modern day, especially U.S. feminism is about. The, the central focus is about justice. And justice means that we acknowledge that for different contexts, for different relationships, for different situations, you're going to need different ways of organizing based on what feels or looks just. Um, so the the organizing of that household, because you might think, well, the guy does everything, taking care of everything. Does the woman cook and clean? That's not necessarily the role or case. And that's something to be determined um, between the couple and partner. But you know, when people look at inheritance laws in Islam and more of the money is given to the male heir, they think that that's that's regressive, but actually that's done so because there's an understanding and acknowledgement that women are going to be protected in their relationships and keep all the money that they make for themselves. So there's a interesting sort of just ordering that makes this idea of equal pay, equal split, very incompatible. <laughs> so then, then that goes to like eat, dining, getting taken out, all of these things. Um, you and I have had a lot of conversations about this. This is why I've said, I feel like I just need to date non-Americans because I can't even believe this is a conversation. <laughs> and that it's actually pretty feminist given the state of how women are paid to the dollar, how women of color are paid on the dollar, which again, you just can unpack per category, um, and people have done studies around it, for the the ways, what they're calling the pink tax, what they're calling women's tax. Um, in the U.S., we pay for more things, whether it's not just feminine products, but security. If you are a single woman in your house, in your car, uh, the psychological weight that has rising cortisol levels in our <laughs> body when we're constantly under threat in a society that hasn't designed for um, a safety for women, um, you would think that taking care of a restaurant bill wouldn't be a big deal, but apparently it is, and then works to the advantage of patriarchal masculinity. Um, but that's why I see the, the ways that, um, again, we're just talking in terms of a cis, hetero, relationship because that's that's what I've spent time thinking and experiencing and I don't want to speak for the experiences of other people either um you would think that um that's actually not big of a deal but um right yeah I, you, yeah. you know Metha I'm I'm always so surprised you know when you know similar to you like in these types of relationships that men ever want to kind of fight for equality on a date or in a relationship <laughs> and not fight for equality at the workforce you know I'm like wow yes. if you're going to fight for a, like female rights like why don't you start at work where there's been like you said 70 cents to the dollar and especially if you're a woman of color you know that uh, that percentage is probably even less. So that to me has always been so surprising. And like, what about you know the pushback that I get from? Because I talk to my male friends about this too, and I agree. I think American culture is very different than European culture and Middle Eastern culture. And um, you know, I think that I think they're also. I will just kind of anecdotally say this. My experience is it feels like in at least in Europe and uh, even in some parts of the Middle East that there's like actually an appreciation for a little bit more of that wildness 
Um, yes. You know, and like yes. that's that powerful kind of feminine uh, quality. So I, I have seen that play out. What about men who, this is the pushback I get from them. What about men who don't make as much? Um, I, okay. Um, well, how much we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what other ways are you also showing up? If I'm, I, I mean, it's, this is, this is a conversation that I think can go into a little bit of a, uh, a context of how you're relating to somebody. If we're talking, I mean, I, I got to be honest. I've dated people who have um, work that um, is was significantly less compensating than my work, and they covered everything. Um, and I think for them, this was a demonstration. And again, we can we can talk about how paying for everything can also be a form of control, which is not something that uh, I would approve of in terms of being a, the financial rock in a relationship. Because again, that's that can be very dangerous for a woman that wants to extricate herself from a situation like that. Um, I'm talking about a way that a man can show up, going back to what a sacred masculinity can look like, that is in service to sacred, feminine, effusive flow of life. Mm. And if you look back, and actually this might be an interesting point. I don't know if it fits here. But if you look back at what these the procedures or practices at these moon goddess temples it was that there were women who were kind of like emissaries for the goddesses that worked the temple to produce energy that was funneled to the moon goddess for the ordering of the cosmos and part of their work <laughs> was basically being sex workers and they um men would come into the temple and please them for the ordering of the the universe. Hmm. And so there I think there's a little something of that memory that's encoded in us and distorting that with um these notions of women, you know, now it's flipped, right? Women serving men um has led to a lot of disharmony between the femme and the masculine. Um so I would say if there was a way to show up to demonstrate that service, I know now it's called courting, <laughs> you know, now it's called all different kinds of things, but a way that, that, that divine protection is being made known for, and it doesn't have to be in monetized ways. I think that still, that still works towards a balance between Femme and mask. Love that. Wow. So, Maitha, I want to talk a little bit. <laughs> this conversation is just moving so fast. I've got so many more questions. Um, how does cortisol play a role in fertility? Because I think this is also an important conversation that we've had in the past. Uh, you know, because I think it'll also ground all the the layers of the conversation we're talking about when it comes to finances. Yeah, and what workplace looks like, which again, for anybody that wants to preserve the work, the power of recreating life through the womb, they would think twice about what what stress does, um, especially to people who have more estrogen and progesterone. Um, so it's interesting. I started to learn about this world through intermittent fasting, and when you first hear about intermittent fasting, you learn about what the different time restricted windows that you could have. And it's usually just explained in, oh, you could do a 24 hour fast and then eat the next day, or you could do these windows of only eight hours of eating. And those are your options or like 12 hours of eating or whatnot. And those are usually the options that are given. Now, <laughs> People realized, oh, wait, 
fasting might negatively impact a body that has progesterone in it. It's because it's great for testosterone and estrogen. And so when those hormones are working, then the spike in cortisol levels really help with, you know, the fat burning, making use of that energy. Now for that week known as PMS, the week before um, the moon cycle during ovulation, and, you know, also possibly during bleeding, you know, there's, there's still debates and um, research being done about a lot of this stuff. But the consensus has now emerged that introducing fasting or any aggressive exercise can actually be quite detrimental to fertility because the rise in cortisol levels will push progesterone to be lowered as well. So that's why when you hear about people having a low fat count or a BMI, women who are athletes losing their periods, that that research is pretty tight. Um, and kind of serves for the foundation of some of this stuff. So um, if you imagine that that's just a conversation around intermittent fasting, we haven't even begun to talk about the stressors that a woman walks around with in the workplace, um, also trying to manage emotional labor, <laughs> trying to man manage being usually a primary caregiver to somebody or a group of people. And again, this is heightened given if you're the eldest daughter in a person of color family, you know, <laughs> if you have children, if you're um, a grandparent or you're taking care of multiple generations of folks. And then in the workplace, sometimes you're relied on as a therapist, you're relied on as a therapist, this is my case, for by my male friends. <laughs> um so the I can't even begin to quantify the amount of stress-derived activities that or stress-derived experiences that a woman's body will undergo just in normal life and then in the workplace. So imagine that on top of all the other things that we discussed. Why? Oh, <laughs> and then also, you know, Gaber Mate in The Myth of Normal talks about who by the way, who I love. Um, he has a chapter about um, uh, pregnant women and um, pregnancy outcomes, delivery outcomes being highly influenced by um, whether or not a woman has a male partner, which contributes to high stress levels. Actually, it's <laughs> the stress of their partner they're carrying. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because once you start to have a discussion about the you know, in some ways people talk about this as unpaid labor, but the unacknowledged labor, I guess I would say that women provide, and especially to men that have been conditioned to see their relationship with women as extractive. Um, I'm, again, not all men. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying all white people. I'm not saying all this or that, but I'm talking about a, a model for producing and reproducing a group of people. Um, the way that they've been taught to extract, of course, tires, exhaust, turns our bodies into not just disarray, but I mean, conditions that are exploding, fibroids for women. Um, and now there's linkages being made between excessive fibroids, not just connected to diet, but to stress levels, to stress levels related to um, misogyny, related to race. Um, the you know, the explosion around UTIs, all of the stuff that's disproportionately affecting women, autoimmune diseases, the amount of women that have been diagnosed with autoimmune diseases and the lack of understanding of where that comes from. All of this clearly points to um, a, a way of being that is not working um, for women, for high femme folks. And once again, it should concern men because it's not just the earth that we're destroying. We're destroying the ability to reproduce and to protect the um, generations and the lineages and the progeny of that cycle of reproduction. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Amen, Matha. <laughs> I was just, you know, I know something we've spoken about before is just this idea that, you know, having a partner that actually contributes to helping lower our cortisol levels is actually a really important aspirational goal, uh, right? Because I think, like you said, it does feel like there's a lot of relationships in which it feels extractive, right? And there's this, you know, this eros, this like really beautiful feminine energy um, that I think is sometimes... I don't know what the word is. Like, it's just, it feels like it's like usurped or like, um, or taken for granted. And I think, you know, it's like, it's like this energy that, that the the feminine needs to, to replenish, right? So ensuring that there's space and time for the feminine to give herself to the divine. We spoke about this, like the woman giving herself to the divine rather than the male partner and the male partner giving themselves to the woman so yes. that that allows her to replenish herself and give kind of contain her energy within herself to be able to even offer that up to society at, at large and the collective at large. Um, and especially from like a mother perspective, right? Like being the, being the mother of the household that is kind of holding all the pieces and layers of a home um, is also, it's so important that we protect a woman's energy in the household. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, one of the quickest ways that you can find out if somebody is an extractor or a raiser of cortisol levels, by the way, you could put that on your dating apps looking for somebody who's like lower, <laughs> who can lower my cortisol levels. Um, I usually ask the question of what is their relationship with other male friends? If they share with them intimate details about their life, if they look to them for counsel around relationship issues if they again you know some might say it's like the proverbial um blind leading the blind <laughs> but of course we you know don't want to use ableist language like that but it's it's like um a uh, misguided or an unguided uh herd <laughs> being <laughs> unguided by another herd um but i do think that is I i've noticed that the crisis in men, and as we've seen, there's also been research done on the rise of the lonely male um, who doesn't know how to create intimate bonds with somebody and has only been socialized to extract and to feel maybe a glimpse of something through extracting from the emotional container of a woman. But I think it, it starts with learning clearly how to create that intimate relationship with self that can figure out a way to do that with other males. And I think this is also why there's the rise of the manosphere misogynist as cult leader. Yeah. Because instead of um, being able to diagnose the issue for them, that's causing real hurt and pain. And they're seeking out something of a way to cure this void that has led to actually high incidence of suicide or, mass shootings or you, um, uh, uh, decisions to enlist in military to, to be violent, basically, either to themselves or to other people. Um, and they, they've gone to them instead of being directed to accessing that vulnerability within themselves. And that's actually what's become a really scary place because – these manosphere cult leaders are doing that to make money off of these these men. Um, they're selling product. They're inducting them into pyramid schemes. And, um, you know, I really, I pray for the awakening of men so that they could feel the gloriousness of being able to connect with themselves to connect with other men and to connect with women and non-gendered folks in a way that f fills and provides a, a flowering um, of this void with new seedlings of possibility. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> <laughs> 
I will be waiting for that day. Uh, Maitha, so you're one of the writers for the Hulu show Rami, and you've spent a lot of time in Hollywood, really illuminating Muslim and Arab tropes in film and television. I'd love to learn a little bit more about some of the themes that have emerged from your research and what you've sort of, you know, noted uh, these days, um, you know, on, on TV and film when it comes to these tropes. Yeah, so I in, uh, so I inadvertently fell into the space because after 9/11 and it's something that I also had been thinking about growing up in the US as an Arab, but um post 9/11 there was this fervent search for Arab Islam all the all the things in our region <laughs> uh 101 explainers so I was frequently invited to high schools, universities to give presentations on who we were, both Arab Muslim and, of course, that, that discrete and that overlapping category. And I started to create a presentation that introduced people to who we are through very familiar iconography and visuals. And that was from where? Hollywood. So I I began with those things, and I remember doing a presentation to a high school in Cleveland. It was like a high, high school wide presentation, and um, one of my friends invited me because his son went to that school, and he had suggested I give that talk. And he spoke to me afterwards. Again, this is Cleveland, this is Midwest. He said, "You know, it's really interesting. It's probably because you're from LA, but you started off talking about Hollywood, <laughs> and." I took a step back because I didn't realize there was any other way to enter this conversation. Um, and maybe it is from my upbringing being in the visceral experience of Hollywood. But with research that I was exploring around how Americans knew and understood what they thought about Arabs and Muslims, a lot of it came from TV and film. A lot of people surveyed and polled said they had never met an Arab or Muslim and that they relied on news, um, blockbuster hits, TV shows to inform their opinions. And so that was frightening to me. Um, so I started to TA classes on exploring ethnicity through film, exploring culture through film, designed a curriculum around showing the film's about us. And then I had this opportunity with Pop Culture Collaborative to design a project around what was very generally, very generally called Muslim narratives. And so again, I said, you know, I want to look at how Hollywood represented us for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. No sane person would say they want to do this project in a year, but I accepted it. I mean, most people who are doing research on this topic are serving surveying the last two years of films. But I decided to undertake this because I'm me. Um, so um, I started with this because um, the film The Sheikh came out in 1921. And so I thought, and that was a film with Rudolph Valentino as the lead and had this white man portraying um, an Arab. And I had that as a marker for the storytelling over that hundred years. The report came out in 2018, but that was basically a beginning point for me. And what I found is what's ironic about this early 20th century time period is that Arabs were portrayed, and Arabs in particular, and Muslims because of that association and inability to see them as distinct and sometimes overlapping categories as what we, what Edward Said would call a very Orientalist framework. And that is feminine, overly sexualized and queer, promiscuous. So all the things that we associate as a, a a region now that allegedly is anti those things was what it was being condemned for in the 20th century. And even, you know, somebody like Elton John writes about 1970s, 1980s, a lot of gay people in Europe would still go to the Middle East as a refuge because queerness was a lot 
a, a lot more acceptable. So anyways, this this early period was, again, fascinating because those are the things that um, Arabs um, and Muslims were uh, negatively stereotyped around. Um, and, of course, we see a, a whitewashing of their storytelling as a way to connect back to places like ancient Egypt, um, biblical stories, to imagine that, you know, people in Egypt and in um, Jerusalem were white. Um, but even up to recently, when we're talking about biblical storytelling, the argument still has been that white people have to play these characters who are from Africa and the Middle East is kind of wild. Um, so we see a lot of that. I mean, I Dream of Genie, also, you know, this, you know, fantastical storytelling is a white woman. And funny enough, this white woman was married to an Arab <laughs> for a period of time. <laughs> um, Barbara Eden. Um, with this report for Pop Culture Collaborative, which I called Huck in Hollywood, Huck meaning truth about how we're being portrayed in Hollywood, I came up with this triangle um, that put at each of its points politics, pop culture, and public opinion. And I basically argued that there's this triangulation of how Muslims are portrayed through these different vectors that are constantly in communication and I'm interested in the dynamics between all of those things because it's hard to say who came up with what first. Was it pop culture that came up with the era, with the image of the Arab? Is it politics for foreign policy reasons? Is it public opinion because there've there's been an audience setting around <laughs> who and what Muslims are like? Um, so basically, the. In the 1970s, when um, the oil crisis happens and there's an embargo by OPEC on the U.S. based on U.S. intervention in the region, and there starts to be a, a bubbling of, of hate towards the Middle East for literally putting the brakes on gasoline flow in the U.S., you see that shift in TV and film. You see the... You see the overly sex, overly rich sheikh who has this black gold underneath his feet and is using it against the U.S. and that we would be the ones. And it's also a very interesting revival of a civilizationalist, a civilizationalist narrative that the native populations are too stupid, are too irresponsible to control the resources in their own land. And so... There was a lot of demonstrating the luxurious overspending, the obscene consumption of the region that was initiated because of this, this um, embargo crisis and then, of course, the hostage crisis and more U.S. interventions, militaristic interventions in the Middle East. And, of course, like after 9-11 and the invasion of – with the invasion of Iraq, which, you know – now we're in this 20th year anniversary. Um, you the, the influx of stories around U.S. militarism in the region is overwhelming. Um, and in fact, I think we've talked about that I can't tell you a full feature film that has ever told the perspective of an Iraqi around the U.S. invasion, that should tell us something. Right. That almost every story is either about the just fight or the progressive version of that is the sad officer, American officer, who realizes this wasn't the fight that he thought he was going to undergo. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's actually part of the reason why I made my short film, A Star in the Desert, because I always felt like that you know, as an Iraqi American, I felt like the in the Iraq War, Iraqis were either perceived as the antagonist um, or the victim, but never the protagonist of the hero's journey. They never actually, you know, were kind of the central, you know, force kind of that lived a life that had emotions, hopes, and dreams. It, you know, so those are the two two themes that I kept seeing over and over again, and it really was just so dehumanizing. Yeah, because 
the Iraqis in that storytelling, even the quote unquote good ones that win the Oscars or get critical acclaim that are part of these prestige films, the Iraqis are props for the hero's journey of the fallen soldier, the psychologically fallen soldier. Right. Right. Absolutely. Wow. So your work is so important, Metha. I'm so happy that you are a part of this conversation. I hope that more uh, folks making movies, especially about the Middle East or including Middle Eastern characters, are going to be pulling you into the conversation. Uh, so I realize that we've actually gone over time. <laughs> it's, so, it's so fascinating to talk to you, and I, we'll have to have you back on the show to continue this conversation. I'd like to just uh, know a little bit more about, you know, what do you want to tell our listeners about your call to action, like what's sort of your main takeaway for us, for everyone listening right now, what do you want them to think about? Like what has been on your mind in terms of things that you'd like to ensure that is, you know, shared with the, with the larger collective? Woo. <laughs> Another big question, Yasmin. <laughs> I, I should, should call your podcast after the semicolon on gateways <laughs> to awakening, <laughs> gateways to awakening, right? Yeah. Gateways to awakening. It should be gateways to awakening, semicolon, big questions. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So actually, I had a mentor tell me one day, she was like, your podcast should actually be called Gateways of Awakening because you can't promise that someone's going to be awakened. It's their choice. It's, a, it's an invitation. Um, mm. You know, it's of of awakening. But, uh, but yeah, I, I totally get that. And I have plenty more questions, but we... Um, we're sadly at time. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to go for something provocative, which is, I guess you could say I'm discursively beta testing. <laughs> um, and maybe it's good to put it out there so I could I could have like a little sort of TM around it. But I've been sitting with this feral femme work has really led me to explore how and why the femme energy is being repressed. And I think I, as I stated, being anti-femme is being anti-life. And that's delved me deeper into not just our relationship to nature, but the way we live in nature and the way nature lives in us and how the construct of the human is this modernist invention to disconnect us from that intra-relationship. Um, and that the human is actually one of our worst inventions <laughs> because <laughs> it's it's led to this hierarchy around creation. It's led to this severed relationship between all forms of created life to be aware of our role and place and service. You know, people talk about sacred stewardship well to be to recognize our transcendence from this construct of human is to be in a state of reverence around the way nature lives inside of us and the way we live in nature so i'm really excited to explore what this can mean i'm very influenced by people like um the what people have called post-colonial but she's so much more than that thinker, Caribbean thinker, Sylvia Winter, um, highly influenced by people within mystical traditions, especially what is called Sufism, but I call it Tasawwuf, and also sitting with different ancient wisdom traditions. I'm really interested now in um, Polynesian, Pacific Islander storytelling and storytelling around origins um, and island peoples. Um, because I feel that um, the the retention in the face of an onslaught of trying to absorb, repress, or take over that land and thus take over the stories and the worldviews of those folks has been able to contain for us um, a vision of life on earth that is regenerative. Um, and I think once we, what I say, shed the human will be able to reveal our divinity. Amazing. And on that note, uh, looking back, you know, what is the one thing that has surprised you the most? In 
Ah, wow, big question. In 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 <laughs> just in culture, it could be about the feral femme. Oh. It could be about uh, you know the work that you've done with uh, the Arab and Muslim tropes. But I'm, I was just coming out of the pandemic as well. You know, like looking back, like why do you think these subjects that you've been spending so much time thinking about and and ruminating about, like what is what has surprised you the most? Oh well. I think I could tackle a lot of those questions because I think each one has an answer to it. Um, for the pandemic, I'm surprised that we didn't carry, that there were so many missed opportunities to carry forth lessons for a complete transformation of how we socially order and connect with each other. And really the only retention is Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, incorporating Zoom into the workplace, sadly. But I, when I mean missed opportunities, there's so many. There is ways of structuring what people have called pod mapping for mutual aid. Um, I know people are continuing to do that work, but reimagining how we can connect to each other to not rely on um, nation states that have proven to us that they don't care about our health, um, but how we can rely on each other to be each other's keeper, protector. Um, and some people are continuing this work. Um, I'm also surprised that we could have pushed for and advocated for a retention of certain things that w became emergency interventions that should be everyday practices, like the, um, the PPP loans. That kind of support towards people and projects, and again, that should have been something not just for business. I know people are having discussions around student loans and why it's so difficult to, to cancel student loans and yet give millions towards businesses. Um, but why can't we request of our government to get, you know, we got, uh, what were those checks called? Now I forgot. I think the checks. Oh, I think it was called the PPP loans. Well, those were the loans, but what were the checks that they gave everybody? Something relief or something. I don't. I don't. Know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so the the COVID relief checks that we got, people prior to the pandemic were imagining universal bas basic income. That could have been a test ground for that, right? Um, and then another thing was, okay. You could land wherever you want, vax, anti-vax, whatever. But the fact that the government was able to pay for a vaccine, make it free, and also make testing free, we should have demanded that be extended and blanketed all over healthcare. All of this should be free. Our government just proved it can do that. And that to me is um, the surprise that we didn't say, Oh, wait, wait. You just showed me you could do that. You just showed me that you could <laughs> dunk on, the, on, on this hoop. And now you're pretending, now you're asking me to lower the hoop, to keep, continue to lower the hoop. No, 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 no. You can, you can hit that. You can definitely swoosh. <laughs> um, but I would say one of the greatest surprises, I think, or that why I continue to teach in academia is Gen Z. I, continue to learn from them about a different imagined future and possibility for present. I know that they get characterized as overly sensitive, as constant, as in a state of wokeness, as if that's derisive. But I think they carry with them the, the secrets, the hidden treasures to retain quote unquote, human life on earth. Um, and I think that if boomers were part of a natural process of eldership, that they would move to the side, provide counsel when needed, but they would let, <laughs> <laughs> they would let us be that bridge for the council so we could translate it to Gen Z and Gen Z could take on the reins to an act of vision for our continued um, species sentient life here. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, I think that how I like to imagine them 
is born into this world with a layer of their skin ripped off, meaning that they are so raw. When you touch them, it's more of an ow than it is for us. But it also means that level of sensitivity has a heightened understanding of awareness that we might not have access to. And, you know, you've seen how we talk about the younger generation just very quickly picking up things that it took us decades to understand. But I also am concerned with the way that uh, the, the, the lack of grace and generosity, the lack of grace, generosity, and agency that they're given to be able to enact this vision, this precious vision of the world that they've been, this precious vision of the world that's been embedded in them mm. to enact. Yes. Yeah. I, I feel very similarly about Gen Z and their level of consciousness and sensitivities and vulnerabilities. And um, yeah, I love that. Step aside, <laughs> boomers. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Matha, this has been so wonderful. Are there any resources that you can point folks to in order to learn more about you, get connected to you and your work? Yeah, I have a website that I need to hire a better graphic designer for. Not that the other <laughs> one wasn't great, but I need to update. Things are so quickly shifting. But I have a website, www.maythaalhassan.com, where you can look at some of my work, some of my offerings. I think I've even uploaded articles that I've li articles that I have written or links to or, or links to some of that work. I also am selling a feral femme robe in collaboration with a with Nor Black and I'm also selling a feral femme robe and t-shirt based on this poem, which was the start of this feral femme concept. It, in collaboration with Nor Black Nor White, it's a capsule and it has a line from my poem. And if you'll indulge me, I'll I'll read that line for folks. Um it it's um, embossed with gold foil and says, we will speak truth to domination because we are power. They may call us crazy, hysterical lunatics now, but soon they'll call us freedom. And uh, that's being sold there and a tie-dye shirt. And that came out of people coming up to me after I performed this poem at the United States of Women in 2018, asking to wear feral femme on their bodies. Um, so yeah, you could check out my work there, um, on my Instagram. I've also uploaded in collaboration with Slow Factory co-launched videos called Key Terms, where I explain some of the origin of these world, some of the origin of these words like feral femme. And that was also supported by pop culture collaborative. So there's that you could watch Rami on Hulu, um, the American Muslim docu-series, we're in the process of taping. I can't really talk about who we're going to work with yet, but it's going to be an exciting partner. And um, this is the, I'm the worst at this. I love just creating work. <laughs> and then uh, sometimes I forget I wrote something and <laughs> somebody will mention a thing and I'll realize, oh, wait, I wrote something about this. Oh, I recorded something on this. But yeah, I think that's that's where you can find my stuff. Amazing. Maytha, thank you so much for your time. I just find you so inspiring and endlessly, you know, entertaining. <laughs> your intellectual curiosity is just unmatched. So I'm super grateful to you know to you and the work that you're doing and all the ways that you're helping kind of really progress culture. Um, so for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learn about why the feminine is feral and why we need to pay attention to cultural changes with Dr. Maytha Al Hassan. And you can tune in to Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, spirituality, and consciousness. Thanks again.